I'm always afraid to say the first word because this mic is often so hot. I'm sure you can't hear a thing I'm saying, can you? Absolutely. Okay. Folks, welcome. Uh, I have learned in this room to use a microphone, so I will. Welcome tonight, the end of our spring schedule uh, and the uh, beginning of the summer schedule, in fact. They overlap, They're looking at me like we don't want to let go of spring, so yeah, keep going. So welcome to the center tonight. I'm glad we have a, a, a nice crowd like this. Uh, part of the work that we do here that uh, I've started um, with the cooperation of uh, the staff and, and also with the Ballantyne family and, and, and some of our other supporters is to begin uh, uh, more in, or to begin again with more intensive research. And so many of you are probably familiar that we've had a doctoral fellow here, our inaugural doctoral fellow, uh, that is Sarah Porterfield. There, Sarah. Hi. <laughs> Part of the requirement of the doctoral fellowship is that you research and write here, that you teach here. Uh, Sarah has been teaching American history uh, here at the college uh, uh, this semester and in the fall. The other requirement is that you invest in the center itself. As the full-year doctoral fellow, you join the staff, you work in the archives in the case of, of Sarah's work, and then you talk about that. So we require two public talks for every fellow that comes for a full year. Sarah talked about her research, which is on the Colorado River and global perspective, which is cutting edge research that looks at the influence that the river had on other situations, rivers, dams, uh, other, other scenarios that made use of the skills gained, the knowledge gained in the 20th century, not just in damming the river, although that was quite a bit of it, but also in exploring the effects of humans on river systems. And so that's what Sarah does as her day job more and more over the next year or two until that dissertation is finished. But she's also worked in our archives. And if you've been in our center gallery, you know that we're quite proud this year of the Western Colorado Power Company archives. That is a, an archive that if you look in the exhibit, you probably get the idea we know everything we can about that archive, about that particular collection. And I'm here to tell you that that's not true. We simply don't. And so what fellows do in the archives is they continue to research and assess those archival collections and then set them up, that is, reorganize them so that they can be open for research. And so right now, only a portion of the Western Colorado Power Company collection, M002, in the center's archives is open for, for, for research. And Sarah's work this year has helped us expand what is open and we will continue to work on that. So we've asked her to talk on her work in the archives, and as an environmental historian, uh, she'll share some perspectives on that tonight. And I feel obligated to do the caveat that you've given me a couple times. Sarah Porterfield is not an expert on the Western Colorado Power Company. And that's a very big distinction to make. We historians, we know what we know and we know what we don't know. And so tonight she'll be talking about her experiences in the collections and, uh, and, and what we can learn from that and probably a few other things you haven't told me yet. So that's very good. Okay. So uh, Sarah Porterfield is uh, working on her doctorate at the University of Colorado Boulder. And it is the prayer of her doctoral committee as well as the staff and her supporters here at the Center of Southwest Studies that sometime in the next five years she completes that dissertation. Three years. I was sandbagging. <laughs> Folks, welcome Sarah Porterfield for her last talk here at the center. Can you turn the lights off in the back? Thanks. Can you guys all hear me okay? Okay, let me know if I get too loud because I uh, learned how to teach on the river uh, where I'm usually competing with 15 year olds who want to maybe run away, um, a rapid right next to me. Um, so I'm used to talking really loudly. So if I get too loud with the mic, let me know. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Jay and everyone here at the center for not only making this talk happen, but also making this year happen. Um, this was a, a pretty exciting opportunity to be, to be able to come out to Durango from Boulder um, and spend a year out here. And, uh, my last day of work is Friday, and I'm headed, I'll be in and out of Durango, but mostly headed back to Boulder um, come Friday. And I'll be there for probably the next two to three years working on my dissertation um, and hopefully finishing that up. Like Jay said, I am the doctoral fellow at the center for this year. And that comes uh, 
as Jay said, with a few different components. I had to get uh, a river picture up here into the talk. Um, so as Jay said, I taught one class last semester, semester of U.S. history from 1877 to the present day. Uh, so reconstruction, end of reconstruction through to the present day. Uh, two classes of ranging in size from, I think they were in the mid-20s to the mid-30s. Um, and learned, I think, more than they did, as you always do, as a teacher through that experience. I submitted my dissertation prospectus to my committee for approval in Boulder this um, January and got that approved. And as Jay said, I work on the Colorado River in a global perspective. So river runners are where I'm starting out with my uh, research this semester or this year and into next year. Um, hydrologists, water managers who work on the Colorado and then go overseas or work overseas and then come back and work on the Colorado and how that global exchange of knowledge happens about the river through recreation, through development, through the science of water, and how those different fields inform each other and work towards or against um, environmental advocacy. And finally, as Jay also said, I work in the center's archival collections, and particularly in the Western Colorado Power Company uh, engineering uh, section of the, the WCPC collection. You'll hear me use that acronym throughout the talk, the WCPC, the Western Colorado Power Company. And I was focused on this engineering section of the collection that was somewhat organized, somewhat not. Um, and so I worked on making a finding aid for it. So eventually you'll be able to go to the center's website and click on the finding aids and see what is in those boxes down in the basement um, that I went through each and every single piece of paper down there. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about the Western Colorado Power Company, um, but in somewhat of a tangential way. Unlike the other folks who have talked this semester, this is, as Jay said, not my field of expertise by a long shot. I think Jay said your talk took you 20 minutes to prepare, but 12 years in the making, right? Um, and this took me quite a few months, uh, nine months, I would say, uh, to prepare this talk in order to um, talk with some knowledge about the Western Colorado Power Company and what electrification did for the Western Slope. And particularly what I found intriguing as an environmental historian. And I'll talk more about what exactly environmental history is here in a minute. Um, I'll give you a brief background to the WCPC. If you're not familiar, I'm sure there are many of you in this room who know more about the, about the WCPC than I do. Um, and then I'll move on to some examples of things that I found really interesting in, in, from the perspective of an environmental historian uh, in this collection. And then I'll open it up for questions, which um, hopefully I'll be able to answer about this collection. So this is a region, uh, obviously, it's, it's our home, right? Or at least mine temporarily. Um, and it's a region that I think many of you know very well. And the Western Slope is a significant place in the history of electrical power generation. Um, from the first use of the alter of alternating current, which I'll talk about here in a minute, um, its mining history, the WCPC itself, etc. And in the 1880s, the largest ore deposits in this region had been pretty much mined out um, in the San Juan Mountains. And in order to stay in operation, mines needed to use ore of, of lesser quality. Again, this is as far as I can understand it. I'm not a mining expert. <laughs> Um, and this necessitated, in order to get the, ore, the, the um, precious metals out of these less uh, rich deposits, this necessitated the use of electrically powered mills in order to get that um, ore out of there. And these mills at first ran on fuels like timber, like coal, but as uh, they logged the timber down further, it got more expensive to transport, more expensive to get the timber there. You could use coal, but that's also very expensive. And so these mine owners were looking for different ways to power their mines. And there's some use of direct current in Western Slope communities. This is a picture from a little bit later, but um, you can see there's an electrical plant right at the mine here. But direct current can't travel very far. So you have to have your power plant very close to, say, your mine or to your city. Um, and it was only used to power maybe a couple street lamps in a city, um, but it couldn't travel very far again. And if a mine went bankrupt, uh, which was liable to happen as electricity got more um, expensive or power got more expensive and um, the ore got less and less rich, you couldn't use that plant for anything else. And so folks in this region are trying to figure out how do we make this economically viable? Um, how do we make power move further than we've been able to before? And L.L. Nunn, which is a name I'm sure some of you are familiar with, um, he worked at, he was a manager at the Gold King Mine, which is this 
um, of mine here on the right side of this picture. He was a manager at, um, at the Gold King Mine, and he found the solution to this problem and sparked the widespread use of electricity. Spark, sorry, I'm not intended. Um, <laughs> not just in the San Juans or the western slope of Colorado, but throughout the country through his development of alternating current at the Ames plant. How many of you have been to the Ames plant around here? Yeah, yeah, I thought a few of you might have been. Um, and this was located a few miles from the Gold King Mine, which at that time was un an unheard of distance to, to make electricity travel to power um, any sort of electrical equipment. And Nunn's development of AC power preceded experiments with such, te such technology in Germany by a few months, and many, including Thomas Edison, were really skeptical of L.L. L. Nunn's experiments. But Nunn managed to prove them all wrong, and in early 1891, he sent hydropower generated by the San Miguel River 2.6 miles from Ames to the Gold King Mine. And again, this is an unprecedented distance for electricity to travel at this time, right? You no longer had to have your plant fueled by timber or coal right at your mine. You could have it fueled as the Ames plant was by hydropower, by water, and have it located further away, which opens up all these possibilities to fuel not only mines, or to, not only to electrify mines, but also cities in this area, like Telluride, as you saw the postcard there before, like Durango, et cetera. And this development of alternating current led to small power companies popping up throughout the region. And in 1913, the Western Colorado Power Company was formed um, by consolidating eight of those companies into one. And the collection that we have here ranges from pre-WCPC formation um, up through and into the later 20th century. Uh, so it encompasses about 100 years of electrical history in the region. Um, and it's pretty fascinating to see a collection cover that much, that much of a span of time. Um, it's a big, big stretch for one collection to cover. And this region is clearly significant for these reasons in electrical history um, and for the engineering of this and the de development of this resource. But it's also really interesting for the way that it shows us how people looked at the natural world in the late 19th and early 20th and into the mid 20th century. Some of the stuff we'll talk about is from the mid 20th century today. And I didn't warn you before, there will be an audience participation part of this uh, talk. So get ready. Your hands ready to go up in the air. But first, before we move on to some examples of interesting things that I found that have to do with environmental history, um, let's talk about environmental history itself and what exactly this is. How many of you is environmental history a new term for? Great, that's good. I'm gonna give a little background to it anyway. Um, so the definition in its most basic sense for environmental history is that environmental history is the study of human interaction with the natural world over time. And historians can debate uh, semantics for a very long time, so you can debate the meaning of every single one of those words. But at its core, this is the, what environmental history takes as its central tenet. How do people interact with the natural world over time? How does that change? How is it perceived culturally? What kind of physical effects does it have, et cetera? Now, in, the in 1990, um, environmental history was still a fairly new field. It came out of the environmental movement of the 60s and 70s, and we start to see some environmental histories um, coming out of that time period. And in 1990, it's still a pretty new field, just starting to be recognized by things like organizations like um, the Association of American Historians, uh, the Organization of American Historians. Um, and Donald, Donald Worcester, who's one of the better known earlier, kind of first generation environmental historians, wrote a, a state of the field essay, a historiography, the history of the history, of environmental history at that time. And he had some really interesting observations to make about it. Uh, first, he said that environmental history studies the role and place of nature in human life, right? Very similar to the definition that I gave back there. And he also, which we're gonna talk about this next quote. Uh, environmental history gives voice to a set of autonomous, independent energies that do not derive from the drives and intentions of any cultures. This second part uh, has come under a lot of scrutiny from the second generation of environmental historians. Uh, people like William Cronin, who teaches at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, wrote a really famous essay called The Trouble with Wilderness, right? Um, Worcester and some earlier environmental historians, not to say that they haven't kind of gone back to, to debate this, um, thought of the natural world as a thing that existed apart from people. 
But what Cronin and others did, Cronin is the most famous example, there are many others who thought about this in a different way, but what Cronin and others did, they said, hold on, nature is a cultural construction. There's this thing called wilderness, but we as people have defined it. So we're intrinsically a part of wilderness or a part of pristine nature. Um, and so what Cronin and others did is say, uh, we're sort of, we want to debate with you. We think that maybe um, culture has a lot to do with these perceptions of nature and perceptions of the natural world and the environment. And we're going to talk more about that today in terms of what I found in the WCPC collections. And today, environmental history is one of the fastest growing fields uh, in the historical profession, one of the fastest growing fields. I was just at the State of the Field talk at the OAH, the Organization of American Historians Conference, the, a couple weeks ago in Missouri. And the big debate was over, well, who do we let into the field and who do we exclude anyone? And today, environmental history ranges from um, history of rivers, as such that I do, uh, to the history of allergies and asthma in the United States, to the international cultural history of the banana. Really good book if you ever <laughs> feel the, the need to read about bananas. Um, and as my advisor, Dr. Paul Sutter, he wrote the kind of follow-up, 23-year-later follow-up to Worcester's State of the Field. Uh, he wrote this in, in um, 2013. And Sutter said, uh, by almost any measure, environmental history is one of the most vital subfields within American history and one of the fastest growing approaches to the study of the past within the larger profession. So um, I'm pretty excited about that, right? Chosen wisely. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I'll focus more, uh, not less on, on this kind of all-encompassing environmental history, and more on the study of human interactions with the natural world. Central question of the field, what is the relationship between human and natural worlds, and how has it shaped history? How has this played out physically, culturally, et cetera? And we can see this very clearly in the WCPC collection, these perceptions of the natural world cultural perceptions of the natural world, as well as physical, right? What does it mean to be out there building um, line, electrical lines in a snowstorm, right? Very physical uh, component to it as well. Now in the history, and I'm sure a couple of you have read this book, uh, A Romance of Electricity on the Western Slope. It's a little pamphlet that was published by the WCPC, um, I think on their 50th anniversary of existence. And on the very first page, it says, this booklet attempts to bring to mind the epic struggle of the men of the Western Colorado Power Company and their predecessors in helping develop an industry and commodity to the point where it is now taken for granted. And as an environmental historian, there are two parts of this quote that are really interesting to me and that tell us a lot about these perceptions of the natural world. The first is epic struggle, right? That this is a battle to control nature, right? That this is really, really hard, which without doubt it was, um, or, or, or a, a struggle to make this resource happen for us to flip a switch, right? And the other thing that I think is really, other, other word that I think is really interesting is take, or phrase is taken for granted, right? We don't really think about turning the light switch on today. Uh, maybe if our family has had history with the WCPC, we think about that when we do, but a lot of us walk in the room and flip the lights, which on, we don't really think about it, right? We take for granted these kinds of natural resources um, in our everyday lives, and it's a big deal when our power goes out, right? You gotta go find your headlamp or people or whatever it may be. Now, we're gonna look at this in two ways. First, visual, a visual, and a textual example. Um, and these are just a couple of examples that I pulled from the archives. There are uh, all sorts of sources in there. There are improvement requisitions, there are blueprints, there are maps, there are newspaper clippings, there's correspondence, all sorts of stuff. But we're going to look at a couple of maps for visual um, analysis and interpretation. And then we'll look at a newspaper clipping about building the new transmission line from Red Mountain Pass down into Uray, Colorado. And think about this quote as we're looking at these. And if you see that, those, those words that I highlighted jump out to you. So this is the audience participation um, part of this. And I'm sure a few of you have seen this map before. So what, what do you notice when you look at this map? What do you see on there? You know, it's a little hard to see. It's all pretty close together. What's that? Pretty close together. It's pretty close together. Yeah, yep, yeah, it's very condensed. Yeah, what else do you see? What's that? It goes over the mountains, yep. What else do you see? What's on 
what's on the map? What have, what have they chosen to put on there? Train tracks. Train tracks? Uh, these are power, um, yeah, these are power lines. Those are train tracks. Yeah. Rivers, yes, there's rivers on here. Okay, we've got rivers. What else? Counties. Counties, yeah. Political boundaries, right? State, states and counties. What else? Generating plants. Generating plants, yep. What else? And there are towns that still exist today. Towns that still exist today, yep. What else? What are the red lines? Transmission. Transmission lines, yeah. What's not on this map? Roads, yeah. What else? When was it created? This, I think, is from the mid 20th century. Yep. Yeah. What else is it on here? Topography. Topography. Yeah. There's no mountains on here. And this is something, as an environmental historian, that I find really, really interesting about this map. Um, and about others as well. We can, we can come back to this one in a minute. But as you can see here, um, this one is even more abstracted. Um, and there's a very good reason for people doing, making a map like this, right? That doesn't show maps. That's very clear and has, has just a few sorts of things on it, um, the necessary things, right? Um, but why are the rivers on here, not the mountains? Yeah, they generate electricity, exactly. So this map, to me as an environmental historian, tells me a lot about what people um, think of when they think of this landscape. You, you all know that there are mountains here, right? You look out the window, and um, we finally got some snow in the little plaza, right? Uh, but we don't see the mountains on here. We don't see, we see rivers, right? But we don't see the really deep canyons that they might be in. And so when looking at maps like this, or like this one, an environmental historian might say, Huh, well that's really interesting. This is a really useful map in a lot of ways, right? It tells us where the generating stations are. This one tells us, it's, it's hard to see here, um, but how much voltage each different color of line can take, right? But what's missing from this map? Topography. Topography, yeah. We're also missing counties here, those political boundaries, right? It's even more kind of abstracted. And so this is really interesting to look at and think about this quote for me. Um, I look at that and I think, oh, that's really interesting. We kind of take for granted with these maps, if they're proposed power lines, as, as some of these are, um, that it, it might be built, right? That maybe mountains aren't going to be a problem. Now, we know that that's not the reality, right? We know that people are going to have a really hard time building power lines through the mountains. But it's almost taken for granted when you look at a map like this that the engineering will happen. And this is something that environmental historians think about. But what are the cultural perceptions of people making these maps? They know that mountains are going to be a problem, but they just have this faith that these things will get built, right? So we can use these kinds of visual aids and visual sources like maps to think about how, how are people seeing this natural world, what's really important to them, right? And of course, there are many different ways to make maps. And it's not to say that these kinds of maps didn't exist during this time, right? If you just go to Google Earth or Google Maps, you can look at terrain, you can look at, there's a topography section, um, you can look at, uh, the actual terrain through Google Earth, right? So there's all these different ways of seeing the natural landscape. And I think as an environmental historian, this is really interesting to me. How do we choose to, per to portray uh, these different landscapes? Right? If you look at a tourist map of the Four Corners region or Southwest Colorado, what do you think is going to be on there? Something you get at the visitor center. What's that? The mountains. The mountains. What else might be on there? Hotels. Hotels, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Restaurants, sign me up, right? Yeah, what else might be on there? What's that? Rivers. rivers. Yeah, rivers, national parks, right? Um, national forests where you can go camping. So it's all about who's making this map. When I'm looking at a map, I think, well, OK, who's making this? And what are they trying to portray in this visual source? What was their thinking going into this? And it's not saying that, they, that these folks, who, these engineers who made these maps are negating the fact that there's mountains there. But it's really interesting to think about what have they chosen to portray? Yeah. Oh, well, those are really operational. Oh, yes, of course. For the users of the system. Of course, yeah. And I'm not saying they don't serve a purpose. I'm just saying it's really interesting to think about what's there and what's not there, right? Even though the creators of these maps knew that the topography is, is reality, right? So now for a textual source. Um, this is an article from Electrical Light and Power magazine from April 
1945 um, that talks about the construction of the power line from Red Mountain Pass down to Ure, um, which is a, a, an epic undertaking, right? Um, this is a pretty incredible uh, undertaking to, to build this line, right? In an area that you know if you drive through there, there's all these avalanche areas, warnings, you know, and all these kinds of um, hazards that come with really steep terrain. And Electrical Lightning Power is a, a trade publication, and it's been in print since 1922. Um, and I went to their website today to see what they were all about. Uh, and they, they, are, they describe themselves as, quote, the authoritative source of electric, uh, electrical industry business news for electric utility executives and management, right? It's a trade publication that, that talks about uh, new developments, right? And this is a big deal for them at this point in 1945 because this is um, a really new way of building this kind of power line, right? Um, and it's going to bring electrification to areas where it hasn't been before. And again, this is kind of epic undertaking that involves a lot of really hard work. And I'm gonna, this is a short article, I know you can't read it from where you are, so I'm going to read it um, for you. They say, working at elevations between 8,000 and 11,000 feet, rugged line construction crews recently overcame the handicap of winter. A 75% 75, uh, 75 labor turnover and mountain hazards to complete the Western Colorado Power Company's new 44 kilovolt transmission line from Red Mountain Pass to URA with a three-quarter mile extension tying into the Tacoma Silverton 44 kilovolt line at Silverton. Constructed to bypass the devastating snow slides, which are a constant peril to the 17 kilovolt line that traverse Imogene Pass at 13,100 feet, the new line follows a more roundabout route at lower elevations and is also more accessible in severe weather. An unseasonable, unseasonal storm blanketed the area the previous winter, the worst storm experienced in 23 years. High winds and blizzard conditions sent unprecedented snow slides running in all directions from high in the San Juan Mountains. Slides roared over cliffs and into basins. Crumpling structures like toothpicks, they crashed through power lines in 12 different inaccessible locations. At one place, two sturdy structures and 2,400 feet of line were swallowed up, and in another, a tower and 900 feet of line were raised. Other slides dammed a river and silenced a hydroelectric generating station. Novel and ingenious transporting materials and supplies were devised and adopted in building a new line. Sure-footed little pack mules like cross arms, insulators, wire, and even poles of long, steep, and twisting trails. Poles were trimmed across deep, wide gorges as far as 1,500 feet across and more than 500 feet from the bottom of the canyon. Poles were blasted in solid rock and drilled with jackhammers to construct the new line. In some cases, the drillers were compelled to use rope slings to hold them on the ledge while they used their jackhammers. The north and south sections of the Western Colorado Power Company system are now sol solidly coupled by means of this new transmission line, which will add much to the security of electrical service in the towns and communities which formerly were partially dependent upon lines which crossed a 13,000-foot mountain range. What do you think of this article? That sounds really hard, right? Um, and a pretty incredible feat of engineering. And looking at this, I, I went through and I tried to figure out what words and phrases are used to describe the environment and what words and phrases are used to describe people in the Western Colorado Power Company. And again, this is not at all to negate the, the really hard work that these men put in up there. Um, but it's to say, well, let's think about how people are talking about this, right? What, what, how did people perceive their surrounding environment during this time? So if you look at words and phrases to describe the environment, and I certainly would describe it as this other out there facing avalanches, right? Hazards, devastating, severe, the worst, unprecedented, slides roared, crumpling structures like toothpicks, inaccessible, swallowed up, raised, damned, silenced, right? It sounds really scary. I don't want to get there. You know, there's, there's avalanches coming down around you and you <coughs> destroyed buildings, right? Two sturdy structures were destroyed. And if you look at the words and the phrases to describe people and how they overcome this challenge, uh, they use words like overcomes, novel, ingenious, rugged. This phrase, drillers were compelled to use rope slings to hold them on ledges while they use their jackhammers. Uh, now solidly coupled, add much to the security. Right, so there's this really different way of describing people and the natural world. And this is what we as environmental historians do, is think about, well, what is this cultural perception of the natural world that surrounds people? Right? It's hazardous, it's devastating, it can be, right? I'm sure you can find accounts at the same time that go in the mountains in the summer and describe it as a paradise, right? Describe it as fields of, of wildflowers, looks like heaven, right? 
So what are these people who are out there or who are reporting on these new kinds of construction, how do they perceive the environment that they're in? And if you look at correspondence and you look at these kinds of newspaper clippings that are in there, um, there's this, as the Western Colorado Power Company book said, there's this epic struggle with the elements so that people can take these kinds of resources for granted. I like flipping lights, which is on when I walk in a room, right? I'm really glad that folks went out and did this. And I also think it's really interesting to think about how we got to this place as well. And again, this isn't to say that it's not a heroic, difficult kind of, of undertaking to construct these, but rather that we can learn a lot about how a culture perceives the natural world um, through how it portrays engineering, how it portrays how it portrays natural resources, right? And if somebody who is, say, a labor historian gets into these archives, they're going to focus on the workers, right? Um, how many workers were there? What were they doing? Were, what, how much were they getting paid? How many of them were killed or died on the job? Um, a social historian is going to go in there and think about, well, okay, where are these people coming from? How many of them are there? Um, what do they eat for dinner, right? Um, cultural historian might look at uh, what books are they reading at the time. Um, and environmental historians take a different perspective on it and think about, well, how are these people relating to their natural environment, to the place that surrounds them during this time? And this brings me back to the theme of people and belief that we looked at this semester. All the talks this semester have talked about um, some, some relationship with belief that we have, whether it's um, Jay's work on Franciscan Friars, the video on um, the San Luis Valley, I'm blanking on the name of the town there. Um, Presto? Presto, yes, thank you. Um, Presto and the spiritual communities that are there. And environmental history is another way of thinking about what are our beliefs about the place that we inhabit? Um, how do we perceive, how do we believe in the natural world that's around us. And that's something different for every one of us, right? But it is shaped and informed by culture. Um, and how, you know, we think, especially in Durango, how many of you have ridden the Iron Horse or are going to next weekend? No? Yeah, me neither. I'm going to be on the train. But how many of you like to go out and hike? Yeah, right? We all like to get out and enjoy this natural world around us, or at least many of us in Durango do. And this is as much a relationship with the natural world as it is to walk into a room and turn a light switch on or as it is to turn on your computer and to use all the components that go into your computer to access information or to write a book or whatever it may be. And environmental history and collections like the Western Colorado Power Company help us understand a lot better how it is we came to build the world that we inhabit. How it is that history got us to this place, um, what resources we have used, and ultimately helps us uh, to better understand how we live in this world, which I ultimately think is the goal of all history. So, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Again, I don't know too much about the details of um, the Western Colorado Power Company itself, but I can certainly try to answer those. Yeah? What did it evolve into? Who took over when they went bankrupt or evolved into? Are they now Excel? WCPC? Um, I know the L LPEA came out of this. I'm sure there's somebody else in this room who can answer this better than I can, but I know the WCPC is no longer in existence. Do you want to take this one? Well, you're asking a cultural historian of New Spain to answer that question. <laughs> You've lived in Durango longer than I have. <laughs> yes, the Rural Electric Cooperative uh, 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 Movement and through uh, LPEA is just one section of the uh, Rural Cooperative uh, Grid. And of course, XL Energy provides a lot of backbone and a few other uh, energy asset holders. Um, that's the that's a simple. You talk power and light, which is in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of correspondence from them in, in this collection as well. They're talking about moving equipment around, um, who's going to pay for what truck, this kind of, yeah. So you see their, their letterhead a lot. Oh sure, yeah. So the question, the question is, is electricity 
um, a human creation or is it natural, right? Um, how do you talk about electricity? Um, I don't work, photons are a part of electricity, right? This shows my ignorance of what, of the science side of this. Um, and I think that, that a lot of environmental historians go very, very deeply into the science of the subject that they're working on. And that's something that I'll be doing with hydrologists and the science of water and what water does and is and moves and all of these kinds of things. Um, so I think that there's a real value to explaining, um, as one of my professors says, like you would to an intelligent alien, right? Um, what the science of these subjects is, right? Hydrology, electricity, whatever it may be. Um, I can't do that for electricity, but I think it's really valuable is that if someone were going to go into this collection and write an environmental history of the WCPC, um, but yes, you talk about what exactly is electricity, how does it work, why does it exist, how does it work differently, both in a natural form, right, lightning, versus a human-created form, turning on lights, which hydropower, et cetera, um, and I think that that kind of question illustrates the complexity of this division of natural and, and human, right? Um, it's a pretty artificial decision, or distinction, and it's something that many of my seminar periods have been um, spent on, right? Can we call anything natural, or does it all have some sort of component of, of human influence in it? Um, just by calling something electricity, do we give it human influence, right? Um, and so. I think that that's a really interesting question and it's a really hard one and it's actually very central to environmental history, right? What do we call natural? What do we call human? Um, what's our role in developing this? And yes, I think you're right. I think it is very benefit. It has done a lot of beneficial things. Um, and this is not to say, any, any of what I said is not to say that um, we shouldn't have electricity or we shouldn't have built these power lines or any of this, but let's just think about how that happened and, and what did people think about that when it was happening? Does that answer your question? In some <laughs> form. There was a hand over here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested. How did all this come about? Was that driven by the investors on the East Coast? Was this used was to emulate some other place where it already existed? Or did these people actually come up with it themselves? I mean, as far as I understand it, it's very um, uh, um, organic to this region. But that's also outside of my sphere of knowledge, right? There are experiments going on in Germany at this time with alternating current um, and in other places. And this is not, you know, moving electricity is not a new thing. Um, but, you know, it's pretty significant that it was done here first. It was done for the express purpose of, of fueling these mines that were further away from the source of power. Um, and again, I can't give you the lineage of who did this, when and where, and, and what exactly <coughs> that entailed. Um, but I. To me, it's very significant that it did happen here, and it happened for these, these purposes of mining, right? This is very particular to this region. It's not just power in Chicago or New York or, or a major metropolitan area. It's like pioneering thinking. Yes, people very. Mm -hmm. in the land. These people, you know, we have this pioneering spirit. We can do just about anything. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, it is very place-based in a lot of ways. Um, and very particular to this region, at least in the, the way that it came about. The end product might be the same as, as whoever it was in Germany that's doing this, right? Um, but it is a very place-based reason for doing this, which has to do with the natural environment, right? We need to get the ore out of these mines, and we need to extract this. We need to figure out, solve this problem, to, to work with this natural world to get us the resources that we need. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, I should say obviously, but as you pointed out during the discussion, during the construction in order to provide this electric energy, uh, the process uh, viewed the environment as an obstacle or mm -hmm. quote, an enemy mm -hmm. to be conquered uh, back in those, of those days. Now, today in our energy business, uh, some of these same issues are now viewed in a whole different light uh, because uh, of the impact on the environment. Right. Uh, so there's a, been a transition now to, in that over these years between the environment the conditions being something you defeat, and now we're now we're trying to res resuscitate, uh, you might say, the environment. Sure. Uh, as a byproduct of this, of this development. Certainly, yeah. I think that's a really good observation, right? L by looking at these maps or this this newspaper article, et cetera. Um, it gives us a snapshot into that moment, right? But again, historians study change over time. 
And so if, you know, if I were going to go write a history, an environmental history of the Western Colorado Power Company, I'd probably start in the 1880s and come through, you know, at least the 1980s. Um, because you can trace that change in perception of the environment over time. Um, and, and that tells us a lot about us as a culture, right? The environmental movement is uh, largely starts in the 1960s and 1970s, and that has a lot to do with how we think about the, the environment and the natural world today. Um, and yeah, I think your, that observation is a very keen one, that this perception changes. This is not static, right? Um, and it can change day to day, right? I've had my share of times in a storm on the river where I'm like, oh my god, I am doing battle right now, right? Um, and then I can go and write my congressman about how I think there should be a new wilderness area. Right? This is something that we all experience and that changes over time. It could be moment to moment, it could be decade to decade, um, source to source, right? Um, so it, yeah, it changes constantly, and that's, that's what we look at. Yeah. Um, yes and no. You know, what I found was mostly, here's the guidelines for building a ranger cabin, because we can't have them commuting or living in a tent. You know, we need to get more, uh, a more comfortable accommodation, right? And in those drawings is, you know, here's the cabin and here's the outhouse. Let's make it a two-wheeler, right? Um, and so there wasn't so much attention to, we're making this place ugly in the sense that we see with, say, Rachel Carson in Silent Spring in, in the early 1960s or the, um, you know, the, the issues of pollution in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, but there is a, well, how do we make this a little bit easier? Um, and how do we interact with this environment in a way that makes it more efficient is mostly what I saw. But yeah, that's a good question. Well, I, I can speak from personal experience on this because my father worked for the power company over there in Telluride at Ames. And I mean, I lived there, I saw him, and day by day, year by year, I think they were, he and his co-workers were mostly interested in get the job done. Mm -hmm. They didn't care, and I'm sorry about this for now, but they didn't care about the environment. Their job was to furnish the power, keep it going, keep that water running, keep the electricity going, mm -hmm. and that was their job. <coughs> and it was tough. Yeah. My dad, my parents spent a year at the Tomboy, mm -hmm. uh, 11,500 feet, by themselves. And it was a ghost town. And they spent a year up there. And he was working for the power company at that time. And um, that was a hard year. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, again, this isn't to say that it's not really hard. And that, that again, you're not you know, doing battle with the elements. but. You know, why, why do we use that, that language, maybe, is a better question to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Just you know, thinking about your drawing, uh, do any you know, figures come up, any engineers or noteworthy people that you're going to you know, elaborate on their story? Sure. Um, in terms of my dissertation? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so the hydrologist, the main hydrologist that I'm looking at is Luna Leopold, who's the son of Aldo Leopold. Um, and he's one of the better known hydrologists in the second half of the 20th century. And he does a lot, I can't remember exactly what the summit is called, but it's like the World Water Summit or something like that. Um, and he did a lot of work on the Colorado, he floated the Colorado many times, um, and then brought that, that kind of knowledge up there. Um, the other, the two Bureau of Reclamation commissioners that I'm looking at are the big ones, Elwood Mead and Floyd Dominey. Um, Elwood Mead was commissioner, um, in the 1920s, he oversaw the construction of Hoover Dam, can't remember the exact years now, mid-20s to the um, mid-30s. Uh, and then Floyd Dominey was commissioner from uh, 59 to 69, and he oversaw the construction of Glen Canyon Dam. Right, These two major um, development structures, monolithic dams on the Colorado, which is partly why I'm looking at them. Right, History, in a lot of senses, tries to kind of look for the, um, the subaltern, the, the folks that don't make it into the history books in a lot of ways. Um, but I also think it's really valuable to look at these big big characters, I would mean, and, and Floyd Dominey, um, and think about how they are such big people. How are they influencing people to look at the natural environment? They built these really, really big dams, right, that supply our power today, um, and our water in the case of Lake Mead. 
which is very quickly falling below the point that it can supply water to Las Vegas. Um, so yeah, so those are my main folks. And then there's a whole smattering of river runners who most people have never heard of that work on Colorado and then, and then go overseas. But yeah, I'm really curious about these bigger names, um, scientists and water managers, and how they had an impact of, at home and abroad. Thank you, Sarah. A few of us will be around after the talk if you have more questions or comments of any type. We've got other things to talk about. So. Anyway, thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, thank you for the uh, technologist back here putting this online and also recording it. I think I'm presently out of the camera where it's looking right at the side of my face, so I'm trying to ignore that. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to have you this spring. We have a full lineup this summer. It will be published shortly. It is Imagining the West, and that's on Wednesdays at 1.30 during the summer. So look for that coming to a paper near you.